the, the funding is coming from a European fund means that instead of getting the money up front, we claim back. So in other words, um, we would spend the money and claim back um, on a, I'm proposing on a six monthly basis. The individual cost for the unit is £1,424 and a rough calculation, well, an exact calculation for us is that it would be um, £36,000 to fit 26 um, vessels. Uh, one, there's, there's, to draw your attention on page, um, the end of page three are some project risks. Um, sorry, I, I made a mistake on the, on the amount, it's £35,136. In terms of the risks, there are weekly conversations going on between all of the IFCAs and the MMO to make sure this project goes smoothly. It's understandably complex because um, across England there are um, over 2,000 vessels. For us, I think, the risks are less, partly because the number of vessels is less, um, but also because the, the number of vessels in our district is, uh, is much uh, better known. We know what we're dealing with. But on point 17, one of the key issues um, is, is regarding the transfer of responsibility, the liability for the, the unit. In other words, uh, within an EMFF project, if, you're, if, you're, if you own the project, then the, the equipment that you buy associated with that project is yours. It belongs to you. And it's, a, it's, um, it's an issue that the MMO and DEFRA are trying to resolve. For example, with a... Um, a signature handing over the liability for that unit to the fisherman who's received it. Um, and the, the, the other key point, I think, with this is that for the fisherman, this will be um, free, of, free of charge. And I understand that DEFRA are consulting on the requirement for all vessels to have this um, equipment in, in the autumn this year. So for us, and the, the, the key key issue at stake, I think, is, is the need for us to use our reserves, £35,000 of reserves, to manage the cash flow of this before we get the money back um, from EMFF. So I think that's, those are the main points that I'd like you to be aware of. A few questions for Tom on this. Um, Tom, can I ask you, um, the systems that they're looking at, do they have um, suitable... Um, search and rescue capability um, that would mitigate the need for personal locator beacons and so on? It's a question I don't, I don't know the answer to, but it's something I will um, find out because it would make sense to me as you ask if, there's a, if it has a backup, if there is um, a means to, to register a distress in the vessel that it serves both those purposes. I think the answer is yes, but I'd like to double check before, before it's confirmed. Mr. Chair, no, yeah. Tom, am I right in thinking that this is actually not compulsory yet? Correct, not as yet. So, in effect, we're applying for grants for units that the fishermen might not want. That's that is a reality, and it's. Um, I think there is a incentive provided um, through this to make the units for free. Um, but part of the consultation and, and part of, of the thinking of this is that um, there may be a requirement in the future that um, in order to land um, fish, there is a requirement that, it, that the vessel is fitted with a VMS. So that's the, the disincentive. So there's, there's a, um, a carrot and a stick, if you like, on this. That's all right, well, I'm trying to get our fish. Uh, we committed ourselves to spend funds. funds. Uh, for equipment that may not be used or, uh, you know, the fishermen may not, if you ask them to sign for liability for it, they'll say stuff it. I, I think you, you've got a valid point. There, there is a pilot scheme already in place that's happening. With there's, there's three pilot schemes. Devon and um, Devon and Seven, um, Pool Harbour and um, on, the, on the East Coast. I think the... Um, the, the 
the, the way the timing goes is that we have to get the, the, the funding application in by the end of June, so the timing is very tight. But what they, and we've all made this point to, to the MMO, but the, they're very keen to make sure we realise that if at any point between handing in the application and the, the decision to actually implement it, we can always remove our applications. There's no commitment yeah. on our part. Yeah. If, if we don't go for it, and it becomes an order from DEFRA, and we've got nothing in place, I would imagine the owners would become on the fishermen then. That's what we're trying to protect. That, I think that's the, the way it's going from the meetings we've had. Um, Steve. Yeah, as for the compulsory aspect, if you read paragraph nine, the government are keen to introduce a statutory instrument to make it so it a legal be. requirement. So although at the moment it's not compulsory, it will be very shortly. Yeah, Harry. Um, it's also my understanding that for compulsory equipment, you can't get funding. Is that correct? So um, that would suggest perhaps doing it sooner rather than later. Um, I also was part of the trial for um, a sucker fish uh, VMS. Um, there was no functionality in that for giving an emergency um, help. Uh, but if it was known that I was in distress, then you could use that to locate me. So it, it does have other impact. Okay. Yeah, I think, I think, Chairman, the, the original uh, two instruments that suckerfish trialed here were uh, version one and uh, they've changed it considerably since then and i'm pretty sure from memory that there is a man overboard facility and uh, uh, an emergency thing built into the new system right okay have we got any more questions okay um just a one about the timing so i was looking at sort of paragraphs 10 to 12 and they're suggesting that there might be three tranches of rolling out the IVMS um, and then paragraph 12 says that, that you know the current the sort of total expenditure would be 35,000 and a bit um, but it may be spread over three years so is that just is that the uncertainty at the minute over whether it will be done in three stages or whether it will just all be done in one? Correct for us um, a lot of the cost is involved in, in flying over the, the, the electrician to, to fit the, the, um, these vessels so one of the things that I've suggested for, for the Isle of Scilly would be for us to do it in paragraph 11 to undertake in one tranche, in which case we spend the money and we then have a, a slightly large amount of money but a shorter amount of time. Could I um, also draw your attention to paragraph 14? I meant to um, highlight this previously. Um, I've talked about this quite informally at the moment with the Fishermen's Association. Um, and obviously we need to, to talk a little bit more about the implications of this. But um, one issue was, was around the ongoing costs, which are uncertain at the moment, but are likely to be between 100 and 150 pounds a year. So that's, that is an implication for all fishermen, that there would be ongoing costs. Uh, is that cost basically the use of a mobile phone to send data off? Does, does it have to be a specific or does it have to be a fancy mobile phone? Will, um, will any brick do? I think it's within the unit is the would be the like a SIM, sender, which uh, which would be sending the data. Yeah. No. No. <laughs> He'd have to have some fitted, I think. <laughs> Are there any more questions to Tom on this item? Yeah, just just Sorry. one, Chairman. Um, any, you may not know, but any idea where the Fishman's Local Action Group fit into this? Because originally, some three years ago, uh, there was uh, a collective bid going to DEFRA to get funding for these units for all fishing boats within Alf, not just our fleet, but all the Cornish fleet as well. It was one big bid. Um, now, I don't know where we are with that. Tony Tomlinson was, was heading it, the, the chairman of the flag. He's also chairman of Cornwall IFCA yeah. at the moment. So um, I don't know whether, uh, where they fit already, in, I don't know. He's also chairman of the Association of IFCA. Correct. So <laughs> the flag is, doesn't, doesn't fit in with us. I think they're involved in some of the trials, but the, the direct relationship is between us 
um, and the the EMF component of MMO, and then the, the licensing and enforcement part of the MMO, um, and the association of IFCAs. The reason for, for asking that is because what Harry said just now about uh, the reason why FLAG were pushing it was because once it became mandatory, then you couldn't get a grant for the, for the units. Mm -hmm. As far, well, as far as I know, that, that aspect has been resolved. I mean, so it's the, the grant, although the, the grant is coming from MMO, from the EMFF to us, it's... Tim. You might want to really know this, Tom, I don't know, but <clears throat> when I went to London in uh, December, I asked the question about the, the... We've got a number of boats that are very small, run on outboard motors, not even, not even got any electrics whatsoever and they thought in london that that was what the paul harbor trial was about the small boats and they thought that there may well be an exemption for these small boats and it would be interesting if you don't already know to find out what's happened to that because they were fairly sure that the real tiny boats might have an exemption and to some of these guys to be fair to them that you know, 100, 150 pounds, it's actually a big deal to a part-time guy in a small pump, you know, so it, it's worth considering. That remains the case, um, and there's still some uncertainty about what may happen to those very small boats, um, and I've heard it discussed, and we, that hasn't, it's yet to be resolved. Primarily, there's an issue around the, 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 uh, the, the boats are so small that they, they can't, um, hook up the electrics to, yeah. to the unit. Yeah. So it's being, it's being looked at, and so it's a technical issue as much as it is a, um, a management and a financial issue. So have we got, are there any more questions on this for Tom? No? So we've got the recommendations one and two. Have I got a proposer, please, that we accept the recommendations? Um, I'll propose that we uh, submit to the EMFF to purchase the IVMS and purchase and install um, and use the reserves to fund it. A seconder? We'll second that. Lovely. Those in favour then, please. Unanimous. Thank you for that report, Tom. Um, Agenda item seven, the Chief Officer Operational Update. Just, just, I mean, I'll just go on here a minute. Um, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank the Council for their time with the, um, the employment of Ricky, our new Marine Enforcement and scientific, scientific Officer. He gives his sincere apologies that he couldn't attend tonight as he was committed to the judo grading and everything else. Um, I also would like to wish Ricky all the best in this new job, which I think he'd be great, and the HR for all their help in the appointment process. And on that note, I'll hand you over to Tom. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Uh, two or three points I'd like to draw your attention to are on this report, and I'm willing to, of course, take any other questions. The um, work is ongoing to, to look at specifications for... Um, for the, the new boat, uh, as was decided at the last meeting, we'll be working together with um, uh, Robert Francis and Tim Allsop in terms of presenting our options and making sure that we're getting something which is uh, fit for purpose and something that, that is a, a good replacement. But having um, Ricky on board means that we can have bring his knowledge into this and make sure that we get something which, which is really going to serve us for the next... Um, the next five to ten years. Um, as you may not know, we are now in the town hall. The move is complete. Um, <clears throat> our equipment remains in the container and partly in the office at Khan Thomas. It's something which remains unresolved and we need to try and find a long-term solution for having somewhere for our, our boating and our wet equipment. It's not something that I propose that we, we discuss and try and solve in detail now. Um, and I'd like to investigate further and find some a better solution to present to you. Um, the last, on in item 10, 
Um, and just to note, if you, you may remember in my report from April, I talked about the need to develop some additional projects. These are things which I'm, I'm, I'm developing in partnership with um, the University and the Marine Biological Association in Plymouth. Um, those three bullet points are for you to be aware of. Um, and I would like to bring them in much fuller detail in September. But broadly, um, my priority is, is, is trying to, to develop projects which have provide us with a much greater insight into what is happening in our marine environment as regarding, um, as you say, as I, I note here, regarding invasive and non-native species. Um, and the third bullet point there is an interesting opportunity, I think, to work uh, more fully with the National Lobster Hatchery in Padstow. I know that in the past, and I've seen pictures of um, releases of lobsters which have taken place, which they've grown in their hatchery in Padstow. But what they're interested in doing, what they would never have been able to establish is when lobsters are caught in the wild, whether they come from the hatchery or whether they're natural wild stock. And what they've been able to develop is a genetic technique which, which enables you to take a, a sample from a lobster which tells you whether it's a wild stock or a, um, a one that's been reared in the hatchery. In other words, what benefit does um, providing a, um, some reared lobsters provide? So I think that would be quite an interesting project for us to investigate. And what I would like to propose is to invite them to come and speak to us in, in September. I think that's, that's it for me. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Tim. Um, Tom, a um, couple of things. Did they mention about doing a release now? Regarding the release, one of the, the implications, if they did a release, then it's, it's more difficult for them to determine um, whether, the, whether, the, whether the, the, the released lobsters were from what has been um, what was done this year. So what I understand is they want to have a clean slate start the study and do the um, the before part of the study, then do the release and then follow the progress through. So in other words, they don't want to do a release now because they want to do a, in a sense, a clean, um, a clean study to see what, what is there. In, 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 a, in a, as I understand it, there's a before and an after and then a control site and all of those need to be in place before that starts. The, the reason I ask is that, um, I've done however many number of the releases and they, if you're talking to them and they are going to do a release, <clears throat> they need to give us a little bit more notice. Okay, the last few times they've been dumped on us and we've had to fit them in at a really busy time. Um, and it is important that it's done in the way it is because the one time that they didn't and they just dropped them in the water, most of them got eaten before they hit the bottom, which was not good. Uh, I saw that. Um, the other question... Um, Eaten by what, as a matter of interest? Rass. Rass, Pollock. It ended up a feeding frenzy. Um, yeah, the, other, the other interesting thing is, is this came up this week with my sea search people. We had a long discussion about n invasive species in Scilly because some of these people have been coming for 20 years. And what, what the problem is with it is that there's many species where there is no base data um, and we need to set up a base data. There is, for example, um, there is a, a fish called a Portuguese red blenny and it's suggested that it's moving up to, from Portugal because the seas are warming up. But when you look, they've been in Ireland for goodness knows how many years and the problem is, is 10 years ago, hardly anyone that went underwater could recognize the difference between a Tompot Blenny and a Portuguese Red Blenny. Now everyone can, so we're, we're getting loads of reports of them. And the same applies to several other species like Okra Luca as well, one of the, the golden kelp. Everyone sort of, but the problem is it could have always been here. So some of these, are the, the water some muddied and we need, to, we need to have a base data, which I think is important. <clears throat> Any other questions for Tom on, yeah? Well, ju just a comment on, uh, first of all, two things really. No, uh, on paragraph six, the, the report <laughs> called uh, not all in the same boat. 
I, I've actually downloaded and printed a copy, really interesting, on the effects of small, uh, small fishermen uh, who don't catch quota fish uh, of what will happen after Brexit. Uh, I recommend that a good read, particularly for fishermen here, because uh, none of us, or, or not, n none of you, uh, are quoted. Or, or there's, I think there's only um, Ian Mitchell that is bound by quotas. Yes. Um, that's the first thing. The second thing is, uh, in paragraph seven, about the, um, the warrant card, is, is there a, could, has there been any progress with contacting Eddie Derriman uh, for uh, I'm, I'm, enforcement? I'm very pleased you raised that. Um, I'm mistaken. He does have um, a valid warrant card. Um, he does. So I can confirm we are we are warranted, compliant, and right. compliant with. So it's it's um, the, although we will be refreshing the training. The fact is that through the season um, we have a warrant officer. I, I think, Chairman, in the in the annual plan. Um, which Tom will now take over, there, there is a guarantee that it's refreshed every three years. Which is good news. Robert. Uh, Tom, could I ask you um, whether there's been any progress with um, David Fletcher in North Wales with, the, with his um, project on um, hatching larvae for crawfish, please? Yes, thank you. That, so... David was in touch with me. Thank you for, for making that link. Um, the project has been submitted. It's a project, it's an interreg project, which is being led by the University of Liverpool. Um, An interreg is a, I mean, it's, the, it's a European fund which allows um, institutions throughout Europe to work together, which is fantastic from a crawfish point of view because we know that the, the larval stage is very long and the, the, the source for, for much of our crawfish would be around the Bay of Biscay and the north coast of, of Spain and, and Portugal. So this project has been submitted. Um, we are um, what are called associate beneficiaries, which means that we are part of the project, but we and our expenses are paid to attend meetings and we get the, the outputs from the meetings. So we're involved, but without a, a financial outlay or a financial benefit as well. Um, the the part that David Fletcher is, is is playing is to look at the technology around the, the, the essentially growing and and um, in the same way that lobster hatchery does for lobsters, um, he's going to be looking at for crawfish, which I understand is very very difficult because of that long larval stage. Um, but I understand he's you know he's an expert in that field. Any other questions for Tom on this? No. Okay. Thank you for that, Tom. Agenda item eight. <laughs> Agenda item eight. I'll put my glasses on. Compliance and enforcement update. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> um, I thought it was going to be a quiet year, but things um, already are um, homing into view, which is uh, making. Uh, my life more interesting and, and certainly I'm having to reprioritize and think about things that we will need to address. Um, in terms of the bylaws, um, the um, hobby recreational fishing bylaw has, um, has not been progressed since 2016, um, but I've been working on a new impact assessment and um, following some feedback from the MMO we have a new draft and what I'm suggesting is that informal consultations, I, I know there's been some discussions which took place in 2015, 2016, but I think that since it's been such a long time, we need to um, re-communicate what has been proposed. Um, and again, to confirm to the committee, this was an agreement from, um, from memory, I think 2016, to require hobby fishermen to tag their gear. In this other point, um, and, and we've, I've been having discussions today um, regarding um, paragraph three. Um, this was just to, to make sure the committee were aware. But my proposal at the moment is that this is something that we address through compliance and through communication, and that we, we're not looking to include um, this requirement on, on, that, on that bylaw. 
Um, the other bylaw which is in the pipeline is the crawfish, um, the agreement to increase the minimum landing size to 110 millimetres. That is probably third in line at the moment. Um, and I will be doing work on it probably towards the end of this year. The reason why that is third in line is because um, a review is required of the fishing gear permit bylaw. As you know, every between three and five years, that's time passes quickly. We're now 2018 and it was 2014 when that fishing gear permit bylaw um, was, was made. So what I'm proposing is that I do some work and bring um, some fuller ideas of how that bylaw um, is going to be reviewed and, and um, improved at the September meeting. There's nothing else I want to draw to your attention. Thank you. Steve. Yeah, uh, thank you, Chair. <coughs> Excuse me, should have done that before I switch the mic on. The, um, uh, uh, on the issue of the hobby fishermen bylaw, the, I, I, I notice here, Tom, in paragraph two, you say there will be extra efforts to ensure the local hobby fishermen are aware of this. The problem is with the hobby fishermen, as I found out in 2015 when uh, I tried to get them all together to talk about this, is that they don't have an association. Unlike the commercial fishermen, we're easy to get together, but the the hobby well, <laughs> in theory, <laughs> easier. <laughs> the, the the hobby fishermen are, are all individuals, and um, I think I called two meetings. The first meeting, I think six turned up, and the second meeting, four turned up. So it, it is a, a practical issue that that needs addressing. Of course, it might be a bit easier now with the um, pr proliferation of email contacts and so on so it may be slightly easier now but just just to be aware that getting the hobby fishermen together is a nightmare good advice we'll, we'll certainly take that advice on board and reading those reports in 2015 2016 when you explained what you had done um i think we will uh, we will work on a communication strategy and use all the means possible for example, using social media, using the radio, using notices to make sure that people are aware. As as you know, it's impossible to to make sure we, we reach everybody. But I think as long as we can show that we have been um, as diligent as we can be, um, I would be satisfied with that. Yeah. Mr. Chair, no. um, Tom, uh, in the minutes of the meeting of the 5th of April, I asked Wendy, actually, if there's any update on... Uh, the landing of buried shellfish by recreational rather than commercial fishermen. Um, a, I wouldn't mind if Wendy knows anything more, and B, if there isn't anything more happening, would it be appropriate to try and get it into one of our bylaws? Um, Wendy, you carry Yeah, that's right. I'll come back to you. Thank you. I did, I did have to double check for um, Tom. Um, it is the case that whether a vessel is registered or licensed or unpowered and unlicensed, as per the new um, statutory instrument, there should be no landing of buried lobster or crayfish. So that's across the board, basically. Um, and I've emailed but, the um, information to So registered and licensed, so that doesn't cover hobby fishermen then? Um, well, it does because it also uh, then goes on to talk unlicensed. about unpowered and unlicensed yeah. and effectively if they are unlicensed they could be recreational or they would be recreational uh, if they're uh, unlicensed because they're not by definition commercial. Mm. So um, I, I would just take this moment to apologise. I thought <coughs> I had an email from Wendy and I mm. forwarded it to everybody. I mm. thought I forwarded it to you. Tim, mm. Tim got, I, I'll just... Well, I will apologise for that, and it did. Yeah. That's how it was worded. But by way, by way of clarification, when I first looked at the guidance, it made reference to all UK British registered vessels, which is what I relayed to yeah. Andrew. Um, Tom asked me the question again because you looked on our gov.uk website and um, it actually when you look at the statutory instrument it actually talks about a relevant British fishing vessel and then the clarification in the definition is that it can be powered or unpowered registered or unlicensed or words to that effect I've given Tom the exact um, guidance there so by implication it covers commercial and recreational so my apologies if there was any confusion on that. So uh, it's powered or uh, powered or unpowered, licensed or unlicensed. Licensed, it's, yeah. it's not 
or unpowered and, and like uh, sorry I, I've got myself mixed up then but the, when you said it first it's saying like an unpowered unlicensed was covered but not powered unlicensed if you see what I mean no so it so it is everything it's ev basically. everything is covered is what you're saying yeah yeah, yeah. the, the nitty-gritty is can, yeah. hobby fishermen cannot land buried shellfish that's to be fair I don't think many would yeah. be looking to I don't but think anyone it, does it, knowingly do they but we hope not. Any other questions? Um, just to uh, mention, please, Tom, uh, you made a mention about the website here, and I, I know that you've got new contact numbers in the, the town hall. So I uh, was just to ask, please, if the website could be updated with the new contact details, please, um, for everybody. Yes, the, 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 all of the website is being updated. Um, and I'm, I'm not sure if I mentioned this in a, in a report to, to come. Um, and it will include all of those, the, the new numbers. Um, but since you, you've drawn attention to it, it's, we know I have done some work to make sure that um, all of the, the, the in, for hobby fishermen, all of the, the measuring details, how to measure. I know that in the past there's been a, a nice little booklet, so I've taken that information and, and made sure that's now on the website. Um, so and I will make sure there is a general update on the phone numbers. Okay. Any other questions for Tom on that issue? No? Okay, thank you. We'll move on to agenda item nine, uh, conservation and protected area assessment update, which Tom will take again, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This is quite, again, quite a short update for you. Um, and again, what I'm, I'm keen to do is make sure we've got an audit of the habitat regulation assessments that we're undertaking. Um, I had a meeting with, with Kate earlier today. And again, we've, we've made sure that we're, we're um, working towards these um, target dates. We have got some outstanding habitat regulation assessments to do. Um, I'm confident that they are um, all going to be in hand and we will meet the, um, those dates. The priority, however, for me at the moment is to do the MCZ assessment for the Bristow to Stones. It's a priority because that site sits outside the SAC and therefore does not benefit from the protection, the existing protection within that MCZ. Um, and also because um, many of the features within that site have a recover conservation objective so as things stand at the moment, the, um, the assessment is in progress. Um, the key bit of missing information are um, the, the VMS tracks of the um, over 10 vessels. Um, and that data is coming to us from the MMO and work that Ricky will be undertaking, which is to understand how that site is used locally. So we need to understand what the current pressures are um, likely to be on those features. The other thing to note about that site is that roughly 18% of it, a small proportion, sits outside the six nautical miles, and that would be under MMO responsibility. But because the greater proportion is ours, we take the lead on that site. Questions for Tom? Steve? Yeah, I think... Um, it the, the paragraph three, right at the very end, reporters drawn a CFAS survey undertaken in 2013, a report written by Tim Alsop. And I well remember that when you were, you had, what was it, a week to produce all the data and put it under pressure by Natural England, not Kate Sugar, incidentally. <laughs> Thank you, Steve. <laughs> no, it was somebody else from, from Exeter, I think. And, um, you know, it was a brilliant, brilliant report, and that is formed the basis of why the Bristol to the Stones managed to get a specific marine con uh, marine conservation status. Tim, um, we can um, many of those photographs in 2013. We've revisited most of those sites in the previous or the the, the subsequent years, and. We visited a number of them last year, and we'll intend to do the same this year. Um, it's certainly up to, to you, Tom, but do you want me to supply photographic evidence again on those or an updated evidence, or if, if that's any use? 
I think certainly if you're going there, the more information that we have, the more recent it is, the better. Um, something I'm exploring is the possibility that we can do some a little bit more work, particularly on the crawfish, because they're a, a really important species. Um, we know they're likely to be in the site, but the, the CFAS survey didn't find any. So I think it's quite important that if that site is going to be done, that we look uh, more carefully to see if there are crawfish there. I, I hasten to add that, that I think that, 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 that the fishermen will bear out what I'm saying here, but as a diver's perspective, if you do your survey, which I think we're talking of CFAS at certain times of, certain times of the year, especially around now, nearly every crawfish you come across is in a hole. If you do the survey in September, they're out and about. So if you're, gonna, if you're not doing it from a diver's perspective, but you're doing it from a, a towed camera, you're very unlikely to see them at, at certain times of the year. Nearly everything is in a hole at the moment. And when, it, when, when you move on, they're out and about, walking about a lot more. And I, I, I don't know whether the fishermen will agree with that, but that, that, from my perspective, what it looks like. Yeah, so they're, they're faster than the... Yeah, yeah, yeah. I would say from my eight years of fishing for crawfish that, yeah, from, from June onwards, they're starting to, to come out and about. But, yeah, certainly not until the autumn that they're really around. Any other questions for Tom on this matter? No? Okay, thank you for that, Tom. Now... Agenda item 10, natural England update, and I'll hand you over to Kay. Thank you, Chairman. Um, so firstly, apologies that this is in the wrong format, I just noticed. I'll uh, sort that out for next time. But um, just some updates. So the first one, uh, I think you've probably all heard me talking about recently, but the proposed extension to the Isles of Scilly SPA um, so that's just, just in for information that there's a proposal for marine extension to the SPA. We're still at the same stage in the process um, as I think we were at the last IFCA meeting. So we're, uh, inf our information has gone from us up to DEFRA and we're waiting for uh, the minister to approve a formal consultation. So which we're still expecting to run during summer and that will be a 12 week formal public consultation. So that will be the next update. Um, but then in the meantime, uh, the tranche three MCZ consultation has been launched. So DEFRA's consultation launched on the 8th of June, World Oceans Day, I think, for a period of six weeks. Uh, so that means it will close on the 20th of July. Um, and there's all, I've just added all the information in there about where you can access the documents and you know, if there's any, uh, anybody wants to respond to the consultation. Um, so this is pertinent to Scilly because in one of the annexes, that, so, so it's largely, new site proposals, but as part of this last tranche of MCZs, they are also looking at additional features proposed for existing MCZs. And this is something that was in my last update to the IFCA as well. So um, I flagged that they might be adding additional features to the Isle of Scilly or proposing the addition, and they are. There's five additional features proposed, um, two for Bristow's to the Stones, which we've just been talking about, so two more habitats, and then the three other features are species within um, uh, High Town, Menavor and Peninis, uh, two stalk jellyfish and one giant goby. So that's for information. And, uh, and the reason they'll be added at this stage, just to add, so it'll be either because they were original... Um, original proposals, finding sanctuary proposals, um, features that weren't designated in the first tranche when the sites were initially designated because at that point the evidence, there wasn't enough evidence to designate, whereas now there is enough evidence, so they're being put forward for designation. And I think that applies to the two features in the Bristow's to the Stones site. For the others, um, there's been a whole assessment across the network and there's a gap filling exercise. So because the um, the sort of government's ambition for the MCZ network, there's certain features, certain species they want to see protected within this network, and they have an idea of sufficiency uh, of the protection within that network. So for this last tranche, they've had a look across the network to see where the, the gaps are for these species and habitats. So that's why you get features like the stalk jellyfish and giant goby that have previously been proposed. Uh, you know, there's some evidence there in the sites, but um, they're proposing addition to those sites now. Um, and then 
just something about our monitoring for this year. So again, we've got the um, funding across to Project Seagrass because they have their ongoing voluntary seagrass survey. So this is just the dive survey of five seagrass beds, which they do every year. Um, and again, we're part funding that for this year. And I think they're booking dates to come out in July or August perhaps. And I don't think there's anything else there, but happy to take any questions. Tim. Okay, I don't know, it, it, a couple of questions on that. Um, if you're interested, I've got Sea Search here at the moment, and we did a survey of the seagrass yesterday at English Island, um, where we where we've got the the post in to um, to show the edge of the area, uh, which is which is where it was last year, which is quite good news. And they also um, recorded yesterday. Um, two different types of stalk jellies, and we're talking of hundreds of them. Now, if you want the data there, I'll ask Lynn to um, make sure you're read in with that, if you want their data. Yeah, I think that, thank you. I think that'll be really useful. I think, um, I think there is a, a sort of official process whereby sea search data gets entered and ends up with Natural England, so we have access to the data. I'll make sure I get a copy, and it goes yeah. to Tom and, and yourself as well, so I'll make sure I get a copy of that. <laughs> Thank you. And one other thing, Kate, um, what, what about tea and sound and stalk jellies? I notice that's not on the list, as a matter of interest. Tea and sound, MCZ, is, is pretty rich with them, on the, certainly on the uh, west side. Um. Are they already a feature? They might already be a feature. Maybe. I don't know, but yeah. I just thought I'd ask that. Yeah, I can check that out. Okay. Right. Any other questions for Kate? Tim? Well, just confirmation, actually. Steve. Chairman, in 3.1, you mentioned the Tranche 3 new marine conservation zone, and the Isles of Scilly is mentioned in it. But uh, from memory, I think that's 12 nautical miles south of Peninis, which is uh, outside our district. But... And I think, from memory, it's it's outside the traffic separation schemes as well. Um, but, however, it, it's useful that we are informed about this, because if DEFRA suddenly decide that, which they may do, they kept hinting that they're going to do it in, in the future, extending our jurisdiction up to 12 miles anyway. So it might just be so, something for the future. I think, are you referring to the south of the Isles of City site? Yeah, yeah. So that, which is a tranche three site. Yeah. Okay. Harry. Um, I, I noticed that the, the great black back gull is a new proposed feature for the SPA. Um, I was just wondering if any research had been done into the impacts of predation by great backpacks. Um, I know certainly on Gyu, the south end of Gyu, which is major breeding area for the greater backpack and used to be for the lesser blackback um, the greaters have now completely taken it over and they're now working on the kitty weight colony um, just in the region of the Turk's Head as well so uh, could you yeah any studies on that? Um, so in sort of direct answer to the question I'm not sure I mean I think people will have been researching it. I don't think there's been any studies on Scilly I'm sure there are some papers about um, impacts of predation. I'm not sure whether it's been looked at in the context of managing an assemblage of seabirds and how you take that into account when you've got some of them that are eating each other, because obviously that's quite complex. Um, but yeah, the reason it's been proposed as an addition, so it's already protected by the existing SPA, but the proposal is to actually add it in as a named feature because so far it's just been a named component of the seabird assemblage. You know, it's there as part of the assemblage, but actually it's now got sufficient importance sort of on a national and biogeographical scale that it, it counts in its own right as a feature. So that's that's why the proposal's there. Now, it, it, is the Great Black Black a feature around the coast or are we particularly lucky to have them here? <laughs> Yeah. Uh, <laughs> well you, said. <laughs> you are indeed blessed with the greater black bat gull, and I think this is the most important colony for them. Mm -hmm. So we now. just have to accept we won't have any turns because we got black backs. So, so. Okay. 
Yeah, you know, we can try and have them all. But we can try and have them all. Robert. Uh, I think this is a serious point, though, Kate. I did bring this up the other day when we were talking about seals and how many juvenile pollock and so on they consume, how many tons in a year. I think, you know, when we're trying to protect species, we really, really need to know whether it's going to devastate other species. You know, we can meddle in all this as much as we like, but actually we could be, you know, upsetting the balance of nature and we could be losing turns, we could be losing the lesser black bats. And, you know, I really do think it's not just a conversation point. I think this needs to get home. Yeah, I mean, I don't think there's any question that we have upset the balance of nature quite a lot. So, so most of the conservation effort is about trying to redress that, you know, trying to work out how we can coexist in the same space as all of these species, you know, and they can do their thing and we can do ours. But I, don't, I think it's very difficult to start looking at, when you've got these complex systems, start looking within them and, and working out how to sort of manage populations. I mean, to me, that seems like more meddling to say, we can get this many of this species of seabird and you know not many of that species i think that's very difficult it would be very sensitive but also be a very difficult management objective to have so really it's about minimizing impacts on those features and then seeing how they settle out and where you get to but yeah it's definitely you know it's on the agenda and people are aware of it and um if there is any research i'll i'll let you know about it lovely okay any other questions for kate Thank you very much for your report, Kate, and coming to this meeting. Um, agenda item 11, the MMO update, and I'll hand you over to Wendy. That's lovely. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, just a fairly brief report from, from the MMO for the meeting today. Um, we would like to draw attention again to EMFF funding. I know it's been mentioned with regards to the IVMS. Um, I understand that as of April this year, there is some 20% of the original funding remaining, about £11 million approximately. And at the moment, the scheme is still expected to continue until 2020. But our advice would be if there is a project or, um, you know, uh, an element um, to support, you know, um, for example, health and safety equipment on fishing boats, that sort of thing, it is probably better to put the application in sooner rather than later. Uh, we haven't got any advice as to any um, early cut-off point, but, you know, as I say, we are in the last sort of tranche of that funding now. And we've got details fully on our website. Um, Tom has spoken um, at length about the, the IVMS um, sort of situation, so I don't really um, feel I need to go on too much more about that. Just to mention, as Tom did, that they are trialling units in IFCA districts, and from our perspective in the southwest marine area, Devon and Seven IFCA are, are undertaking that at the moment. Um, moving into the, the sort of summer season, where obviously our 10 metre and under fleet are, are more active now, um, and obviously we have more fish and shellfish being landed, um, we are progressing uh, reminders to buyers of um, first sell fish directly from vessels about their requirements to be registered with the MMO and to submit the relevant buyer's sales notes either by paper or electronically online. Uh, we can give assistance through the local office to support applications and um, use of the system with that as required. And then finally, um, we now have um, two additional marine officers at Hale MMO, which um, covers Scilly. Uh, you'll be aware, obviously, that Doug Holt has joined us um, in recent times, and we also have uh, Anna Nidon Chadder. Um, both Doug and Anna are undertaking their training at the moment, um, and uh, you know, hopefully, will um, progress towards their warrants um, in due course. Um, also, that um, we would be looking, hopefully, to support some joint working with the Isles of Scilly IFCA uh, as the, the summer goes forward. So, thank, nothing thank more you. for me. Thank are, are there you. any questions for Wendy while she's here? On MMO matters or not? No. Thank you very much for your report and for coming to this meeting. Um, agenda item 12 is the budget update. <laughs> I hope you've all read it. And I'll hand you over to Tom. Thank you, um, Mr. Chairman. To, I'd like to highlight a few points within this paper. The, the reason why I've brought it to your attention is. is partly because I've, I've spent a bit of time um, doing some work to understand our own budget 
um, from a personal point of view. And I think, to a certain extent, a lot of this is just the reality of being a small IFCA, and, and I'm sure many of you are, are, are very used to dealing with a, um, a small budget. Um, but to highlight the fact, of course, that the, the, the budget we work from, um, the, the broad majority of which um, comes from DEFRA's New Burdens funding, which um, is currently profiled to um, finish in 2020. Now, together with the chairman, um, and in fact all of the IFCAs, we are, we've made the point that it's very important that this funding continues, not least um, essential from the Isles of Silly IFCA point of view. So, again, together with the chairman, we are working through the Association of IFCAs to highlight how important this funding is and how important it is for it to continue in order for us to continue operating and, and doing the job that we do. Um, so, of course, we will bring you up to date um, as and when we receive um, uh, new information regarding that. The other thing, of course, that's, that's um, a, of issue for, for us and for me, of course, is the, the fact that um, small um, amounts can have a significant impact. So, for example, if we prosecute a legal case, there is um, an attendant risk with that, that that could, um, you know, if, obviously, if we lose that case, then, then that's um, a, a disproportionate risk, I think, to us, as opposed to any other IFCAs who would be um, pursuing a number of cases um, and would be better able to absorb um, a situation which they um, they lost a prosecution. On um, page three, and this was what I've done is is and, and this is how I I personally like to see things in a bit more detail to understand where our budget is being spent. And what I've done is provided um, just a slightly different presentation of of budget um, and how that how that goes through the year and, and clearly obviously the, the the vast majority is is on um on, on personnel people costs um but of course what we can try and do is is um use projects and and um, funded projects to improve the work and to develop as you've done in the past to to do the the, the added monitoring and um research that we need to do but I think the, the key point really is to make sure that we are um, as strident as we, we can be with DEFRA as to the importance of that ongoing funding. I'd just like to make a point that, that Tom has been thrown in at the deep end with the financial situation of the SIFCA. Um, as you all know, the authority is now dealing financially with Cornwall. And it hasn't been quite as straightforward as it was and that's what I want to say. I am going to insist we have a financial officer from the council at the next meeting to give a full budget report because there's a lot of unanswered questions in my opinion that I still haven't got to the bottom of and I don't think it's fair to put Tom on the spot with um, things that have probably happened before Tom took over. And I think as we're all aware it is the chief officer that is accountable and responsible for the budget and on the predecessor, didn't get any financial help for three months, which is worth noting. So we need to get to the bottom of this. And I'll, Robert. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, there, there has been questions asked in council as well, as I think you're aware, um, about um, how the funds are allocated vis-a-vis um, um, DEFRA and indeed our own council. So um, as requested to you, I would hope that the um, yeah. financial officer will help you yeah. um, give us some information that I can present to members yeah. um, in due course so that they understand how exactly how the IFCRA is funded. Yeah. Thank you. Are there any questions? Well, Steve. Uh, yeah, thank you, Chairman. Just a couple of things. Uh, paragraph six and paragraph eight. Paragraph six about DEFRA. Uh, sorry, um, it should highlight how IFCAs provide value for money. DEFRA have actually recognised that um, uh, the IFCAs give three times the value 
of their layout. In other words, they, um, for members' information, in case you didn't know, the DEFRA grant is three million pounds a year for nine to million pounds of what shared were. between all ten uh, IFCAs. Unfortunately, we don't get three hundred thousand, which I originally hoped for, but <laughs> it's on proportionate basis. But De DEFRA's um, understanding is that they get three times the value of that three million pounds, so they get nine million pounds worth of value from the IFCAs. So that that's a useful tool to use in trying to twist their arm to keep the new burdens funding going. As for paragraph eight, um, it seems disproportionate. <clears throat> the twelve thousand pounds a year for our for our membership of the, of the association, uh, and it used to be based before IFCAS came along on four ninths, four over nine of the total. In other words, if it was nine thousand uh, pounds, we only paid four. But the others paid nine. But once the IFCAS came in, and Defra included thirteen thousand pounds a year inside the grant, the, the total grant money, um, thirteen thousand was put aside for membership of the association. But the the association membership is actually twelve thousand. So in in essence, there's a one one thousand pound difference there. Um, yeah, so it, just to put that in context, really, Chairman. Uh, the other thing, I've got a couple of questions on the spreadsheet and whether, uh, for instance, I'd, why um, are there two layers of insurance, organisational costs? You've got liability insurance and insurance underneath it as well. What is, what is the difference? There? So, thank you. The, the difference is the we pay a liability insurance um, as part of our employee liability, as part of a contribution to the overall council's employee liability. In other words, uh, if, right. if um, an accident happens, yeah. that's, that is us covered. Whereas that um, the 2,738 is for the insurance for the, the Matt Lethbridge. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Yeah, the other one, Chairman, is um, uh, just for information, really, the MCSS money, 1,000, that's for the dongle, which gives us access to um, the MMO database yeah. so that we can track criminal records and all sorts of things. It's, it's a secure dongle which slots into a computer. Have we any more questions on the budget paper that we have at the moment? No? Okay. Um, there are no reports in part two. There are no reports in part three. So I will close the meeting at 7.35. Thank you all for attending.